In this lecture, we shall discuss the fourth set of revision questions and answers on civil procedure in Ghana. Fourth set of revision questions and answers related to civil procedure in Ghana. So we shall look at a number of questions as well as the answers. And these questions are to assist us in our revision of civil procedure in Ghana. The first question reads as follows. When an action is commenced in the High Court, can the plaintiff himself proceed to serve the writ of summons on the defendant? When an action is commenced in the High Court, can the plaintiff himself proceed to serve the writ of summons on the defendant? The answer is as follows. According to Order 7 Rule 1 of the CI 47, a document which is required to be served on the person shall be served by a bailiff of the court or a process server registered with the court, but a party may direct service. According to Order 7 Rule 1 of the CI 47, a document which is required to be served on the person shall be served by a bailiff of the court or a process server registered with the court, but a party may direct service. Now, what do you mean by this answer? It means that the plaintiff himself cannot proceed to serve the writ of summons. The writ of summons, according to the rules, has to be served by a bailiff or a process server registered with the court. But the rules allow a party to direct service. So the plaintiff can go with the bailiff and direct and point that this is the defendant, serve him. So the rules say that, but a party may direct serve. You can direct the bailiff to serve the process on a particular person, but you cannot go and say that you are serving yourself. So the answer reads as follows. According to Order 7 Rule 1 of CI 47, a document which is required to be served on the person shall be served by a bailiff of the court or a process server registered with the court but a party may direct service. The next question reads as follows. When a document is required to be served personally and the defendant against whom the action is commenced is not served personally, and it's also not served through any other lawful means. But the court proceeds to hear the case and grant judgment against the person who was never served with the processes. What is the effect of such a non-service on the proceedings before the court? Again, when a document is required to be served personally, and the defendant against whom the action is commenced is not served personally. And it's also not served through any other lawful means. But the court proceeds to hear the case and grants judgment against the person who was never served with the processes. What is the effect of such a non-service on the proceedings before the court? The answer is as follows. The law is that when a person is not served with the process, and yet the court proceeds to hear the case against such a person who was not served, 
such a defect amounts to a breach of natural justice, specifically all the Alteran party. This means the right of the party who was not saved to be hurt has been breached. Such a non-service goes to jurisdiction and renders the whole proceedings a nullity. This is supported by the case of Republic versus High Court, ex parte Saloum and others. So the comment about this answer is that if you don't serve a person and you proceed to hear the action against that person, because you haven't served the person, the person doesn't have the opportunity to put the side of the case across. So it means that you have breached the party's right to be heard. It goes to jurisdiction and it renders the whole proceedings analytic. The next question reads as follows. Kofi Ampedu has commenced an action against Angela Tego over a parcel of land situated at Osu in Accra. When the bailiff of the court proceeded to Angela Tego's house to serve her with the writ of summons, she rained insults on the bailiff and threatened to smash the head of the bailiff with a cudgel. The bailiff, fearing for his life, threw the writ of summons against the head of Angela Tego. And when the bailiff noticed that the writ of summons had landed on Angela's head and fallen on the floor right beside her, he left the writ of summons and returned to proof service of the writ on Angela. Angela refused to enter appearance and judgment in default of appearance was accordingly entered against her. Angela has filed an application to now set aside the entire proceedings on the ground that she was never served with the writ of summons. What are her chances of setting aside the proceedings on the basis that she was not served with the writ of summons? The answer to the question is as follows. According to Order 7, Rule 3, Sub Rule 2 of the CI 47, where personal service of a document is hindered through threats, and the document is left as close to the person as possible, that will be deemed to be proper service. Therefore, Angela has no chance of overturning the judgment on that ground. Again, the answer says that according to order 7, rule 3, sub rule 2 of the CI 47, where personal service of a document is hindered through threats and the document is left as close as possible to the person, that will be deemed to be proper service. Therefore, Angela has no chance of overturning the judgment on that ground. The next question reads as follows. What is the lay down procedure for serving a company with a writ of summons? What is the lay down procedure for serving a company with a writ of summons? The answer is as follows. According to section 291, of the Companies Act 2019, Act 992. A document may be served on the company by A, leaving it at or sending it by post to the registered office of the company or the latest office registered by the registrar as the registered address of the company or 
sending it to the official electronic mail address of the company registered with the registrar and sending it by faxing machine to a telephone number used by that company for the transmission of documents by fac simile subsection 2 a document to be served by posts or a company shall be posted in the time that admits of its being delivered in due course of delivery within the time prescribed for the service of the document. Subsection 3. In proving service, it shall be sufficient to prove that a letter containing the document was properly addressed, prepaid and posted, whether or not by a registered post. Subsection 4. Where the registered address or where the registered office of a company cannot be traced, service on the director of the company or if a director cannot be traced in the public on a member of the company shall be deemed good and effectual service for the company. Again, where the registered office of a company cannot be traced, service on a director of the company or if a director cannot be traced in the republic on a member of the company shall be deemed to be good and effectual service on the company subsection 5 where it is proved that a document was in fact received by the director managing director or company secretary the document shall be deemed to have been served on the company despite the fact that service may not have been effected in accordance with subsection 1, 2, 3, or 4. Again, where it is proved that the document was in fact received by the director, managing director or company secretary, the document shall be deemed to have been served on the company despite the fact that service may not have been effected in accordance with subsection 1, 2, 3, or 4 of section 291 of the Act. The next question reads as follows. Under what circumstance will the court grant an order for the substituted service of a writ of summons? Under what circumstance will the court grant an order for the substituted service of a writ of summons? The answer is as follows. According to Order 7 Rule 6 of the CI 47, the court will grant an order of substituted service in the following instances. 1. When the bailiff has attempted three or more attempts to effect personal service but has not been successful and any further attempt will result in undue delay. Or, it will be otherwise impracticable to effect personal service. Let me pass a comment about this answer. There's I and II. It is important to state the I properly. The I reads as follows. When the bailiff has made three or more attempts to effect personal service, but has not been successful, and any further attempt will result in undue delay. It is this whole point that makes up point one. Do not separate it and say that when the bailiff has made three or more attempts and is not successful, or when any further attempt will result in undue delay. No. The operative word that joins the two points is end. So, when the bailiff has attempted three or more 
attempts to effect personal service but has not been successful and any further attempt will result in undue delay. In other words, even if you've made three or more attempts, it doesn't automatically entitle you to apply for substituted service. You must show that you have tried three times and that any further attempts to effect personal service will result in undue delay. That is when you would have met point I. And then the point, another point is or it will be otherwise impracticable to effect personal service. So there are two grounds under which you can apply for substituted service. The first one is when the bailiff has attempted three or more times to effect personal service but has not been successful and any further attempt will result in undue delay. That is point one. Or it will be otherwise impracticable to effect personal service. The next question reads as follows. Under what circumstance is a defendant allowed by the rules to enter conditional appearance? Under what circumstance is a defendant allowed by the rules to enter conditional appearance? The answer is as follows. By the combined effects of Order 9 Rule 7 of CI 47, as well as the case of Republic vs. High Court, Accra, as part the IET, 2003-2005, one Ghana law reports at page 537, a defendant can enter conditional appearance for the purpose of objecting to 1. Issuance of the writ of summons. 2. Service of the writ of summons. 3. Notice of the writ of summons. And 4. Jurisdiction of the court. So the answer is by the combined effects of Order 907 of the CI 47, as well as the case of Republic versus High Court Accra, ex parte IET. A defendant can enter conditional appearance for the purpose of objecting to four different things. So objecting to one, issuance of the writ of summons. Objecting to number two, service of the writ of summons. Objecting to number three, objection to the notice of the writ of summons or objecting to the jurisdiction of the courts. So the purpose of entering conditional appearance by a defendant can be to object to the issuance of the writ of summons, service of the writ of summons, notice of the writ of summons, or the jurisdiction of the court. The next question reads as follows. What do the rules require a defendant who has entered conditional appearance to do? And what is the consequence of the defendant failing to take such steps? What do the rules require defendants who has entered a conditional appearance to do? And what is the consequence of the defendant failing to take such steps? What do the rules require defendants who has entered conditional appearance to do? And what is the consequence of the defendant failing to take such steps? The answer is as follows. According to Order 9 Rule 7 of the CI 47, after entering conditional appearance, the defendant has 14 days to apply to the court to object to 1. The issuance of the writ of summons, 2. To object to the service of the writ of summons, Three, to object to the notice of the writ of summons or to object to number four, the jurisdiction of the courts. In the events that the defendant fails to raise this objection within 14 days, the conditional appearance shall convert to become an unconditional appearance and therefore time will begin to run for the defendant to file his defense. 
the next question reads as follows. Nana Asante filed the writ of summons and a statement of claim against Chief Amuzu in the High Court Cape Coast for the retrieval of ownership of a plot of land located in the Brie within the eastern region of Ghana. Again, Nana Asante filed the writ of summons and a statement of claim against Chief Amuzu in the High Court Cape Coast for the retrieval of ownership of a plot of land located in a brie within the eastern region of Ghana. Michael Olusu Esquire, representing Chief Amuzu, entered a conditional appearance and filed a motion on notice to challenge the validity of the writ of summons based on jurisdictional grounds. As the legal representative of Nana Asante, the plaintiff, what arguments will you present in accordance with the civil procedure rules to counter the application to nullify the writ of summons? So a comment on this question is that you will notice that the defendant has applied to set aside the writ of summons because the land is situated in the eastern region, but the action has been commenced in the central region, Cape Coast. So the defendant has applied to set aside the writ of summons on jurisdictional grounds that it is a nullity. What is the answer to this question? The answer is as follows. Commencing an action in the wrong venue does not affect the validity of the writ of summons and also does not deprive the High Court of Jurisdiction over the matter. This is because under Article 126 of the 1992 Constitution, there is only one High Court in Ghana with jurisdiction throughout the country. On the authority of Wuridu versus Mimtimba, the several divisions of the High Court are all different divisions of that single High Court established under Article 126 of the 1992 Constitution. Therefore, even though the action has been commenced at Cape Coast, instead of a brie where the land is situated, the High Court in Cape Coast technically has jurisdiction over the matter. However, for convenience sake, the action rather ought to have been commenced at the Eastern Region. Since it has been commenced at the wrong venue, the right action for the defendant to take is to comply with order 3 of the CI 47 by objecting to the venue before or at the time that the defendant is required to file a defense. Also, the court can on its own motion refer the suit to the Chief Justice to transfer same to the right venue in compliance with section 104 of Acts 459. That is the end of the answer. Key point you should take note of that under Article 126 of the Constitution, there's only one High Court in Ghana. And therefore, commencing the action in the wrong venue does not affect the validity of the writ of summons. What the defendant is required to do is to object to the venue before or at the time that the defendant is required to file a defense. Please take note of the time that the objection can be raised before or at the time that the defendant is required to file a defense. Take note of this critical information on when you can raise the objection. Also, the court can on its own motion refer the suit to the Chief Justice to transfer him to the right venue in compliance with Section 104 over 459, which is the Courts Act 1993, Act 459. The next question reads as follows. In a suit commenced in a district court in Ghana, an application for joinder was, as a defendant was filed in the name of Kwame AJ. The application was signed by Amma AJ. So take note. 
an application for joiner as a defendant was filed in the name of Kwame Eje. The application was signed by Amma Eje, meaning that even though the application for joiner was being made in Kwame Eje's name, the application was rather signed by Amma Eje. The court granted the application, resulting in Kwame Eje being joined as the second defendant. Meaning that even though Kwame Eje has been, has been joined, he never signed the application. The application was rather signed by Amma Eje. However, however, Kwame Eje failed to appear at the trial to provide evidence. And instead, Amma Eje testified on his behalf. So again, Kwame Eje, in whose name the agenda was filed, he has not filed up, he has not signed the application. He didn't testify as well, but this same Amma Eje was the one who testified on his behalf. During the course of the litigation, Amma Eje passed away and was substituted by Kofi Mensah. The district magistrate concluded that the plaintiff had not met the burden of proof and rendered judgment in favor of the first defendant. The plaintiff appealed against the decision of the district magistrates on the main ground that the joinder of Kwame IJ was wrong in law and that the irregularity vitiated the whole trial. Discard the merits of the plaintiff's appeal. So the essential points to note about the question are that the suit in this case was commenced in the district courts. And the suit was commenced against a defendant. But the plaintiff filed an application for joinder. That an that not a plaintiff, but an application for joinder was filed in the name of somebody called Kwame AJ. But when that application for gender was filed in the name of Kwame Eji, that Kwame Eji himself didn't even sign the application for gender. The application was rather signed by a person called Amma Eji. Kwame Eji too didn't testify, and it was this Amma Eji who went to testify. Ultimately, judgment was given against the plaintiff. Now, the plaintiff is complaining that the joinder of Kwame Eji, who didn't sign the application and who didn't testify, was wrong in law and that the irregularity vitiated the whole trial. And he has now appealed on those grounds. What will be the chances of the appeal? The answer is as follows. This question is based on the case of Pius and Mensah. An application for joinder must be made by the applicant himself and not in the name of another. Consequently, the joinder was wrong in law. And the co-defendant should be struck out of the action with costs against Amma Aji personally. The misjoinder did not vitiate the whole of the proceedings because misjoinder or non-joinder of parties does not vitiate proceedings. On the evidence as a whole, the plaintiff failed to discharge the burden of proof. The plaintiff's appeal has no merit. Let me explain this answer. The answer is to the effect that the application for gender ought to be made by the applicant himself and not in the name of the other. In other words, on the facts of the case, since the gender application was signed by Amma AJ, she couldn't have signed a gender application which was done in the name of Kwame AJ. That is why the answer says that an application for gender must be made by the applicant himself and not in the name of the other. In other words, on the facts of the case, if anyone at all could have signed the application for joinder, it ought to have been Kwame Eji himself. But from the facts, it was rather signed by Amma Eji. It is for this reason that the answer says that consequently, the joinder was wrong in law and the co-defendant should be struck out of the action. With cause against Amma Eji personally, 
the cost must be against Ama AJ personally because why do you go and sign an application when you are not the applicant? So the cost must be against Ama AJ personally. Now, what is the effect of the misjoinder? The answer is that the misjoinder did not vitiate the whole of the proceedings because misjoinder or non-joinder of parties does not vitiate proceedings. On the evidence as a whole, the plaintiff failed to discharge the burden of proof. In other words, the plaintiff lost the case because he failed to discharge the burden of proof. And he didn't lose the case because of misjoinder or non-joinder of parties. He lost the case based on the merit itself because he failed to discharge the burden of proof. The plaintiff's appeal therefore has no merit. That is the end of the answer. The next question. Reads as follows. Joseph Mensah issued a writ of summons in the High Court Kumasi against Kwame Boatin for declaration of title and recovery of possession of a parcel of land located at Shama, a village in the Western region. Kwame Boatin has sought your legal advice on the case. What does the Civil Procedure Rules 2004 require you to do for him and why? The question again. Joseph Mensah issued a writ of summons in the High Court Kumasi against Kwame Boatin for declaration of title and recovery of possession of a parcel of land located in Shama, a village in the Western region. So take note, the writ has been issued in the High Court Kumasi, but the land is in the village in the Western region. Kwame Boatin, who is a defendant, has sought your advice on the case. What does the Civil Procedure Rules 2004 require you to do for him and why? The answer is as follows. I will first enter appearance and then object to the venue before or at the time that the defendant is required to file a defense. Again, I will first enter appearance and then object to the venue before or at the time that the defendant is required to file a defense. This is because since the suit relates to land, Order 3 of the CI 47 requires that the action ought to be commenced at the place where the land is situated. From the fact the land is situated at Shama, therefore the action ought to have been commenced in the western region. After the objection has been raised, the trial judge would be required to comply with Order 3 by referring the suit to the Chief Justice for same to be transferred to the right venue in compliance with Section 104 of the Courts Act of 1993, Act 459. Take note of the answer carefully. It says, I will first enter appearance and then object to the venue. Look at the time that you have to object before or at the time that the defendant is required to file a defense. Take note of that. And remember section 104 of the court acts. That's the section in the court acts that gave the chief justice the power to transfer. The next question reads as follows. Your favor who contested in the parliamentary election, parliamentary by-election for the Oboba constituency in Accra and did not emerge as a winner, has sought your counsel to dispute the election outcome. When can you commence this action? Who can commence the action? And in what forum can the action be commenced at? Again, the question reads, your favor who contested in the parliamentary by-election for the Oboba constituency in Accra and did not emerge as a winner, has sought your counsel to dispute the election outcome. When can you commence this action? Who can commence the action? And in what forum can the action be commenced at? The answer is as follows. The action must be commenced in the High Court within 21 days 
after the publication of the results in the Gazette, as provided for under Section 18 of the Representation of the People Law, 1992 PNS Law 284. For the persons who can commence the action, Section 17 of PNDC Law 284 provides that the petition shall be filed by any of the following persons. A. A person who lawfully voted or had the right to vote at the election to which the petition relates. Again, a person who lawfully voted or had the right to vote at the election to which the petition relates. B. A person claiming to have had a right to be elected at the election. B. A person claiming to have had the right to be elected at the election. C. A person alleging to have been a candidate at the election. And D. A person claiming to have had the right to be nominated as a candidate at the election. The next question reads as follows. On the 18th of September 2022, the High Court granted an application for joinder filed by lawyer Kwame Azingu to add Ama as a second defendant in a lawsuit. What necessary steps should lawyer Kwame take to make the order of joinder legally effective? What necessary steps should lawyer Kwame take to make the order of joinder legally effective? The answer is as follows. The writ shall, within 14 days after the order is made, or within such time as specified in the order, be amended accordingly, and endorsed with a reference to the order, in pursuance of which the amendment is made, and the date on which the order for the amendment is made. Again, the writ shall, within 14 days after the order is made, or within such time as specified in the order, be amended accordingly, and endorsed with a reference to the order in pursuance of which the amendment is made, and the date on which the order of the amendment is made. In other words, if you are amending the writ, the writ should be amended within 14 days, or maybe the judge would have given a different timeline. So, or within such time, as specified in the order. But when you're amending the rates, make sure you endorse on the rate of summons and make reference to the order that gives you the permission to amend and the date on which that order too was made. The person on whose application the gender is granted shall cause the order to be noted in the course book by the registrar. After this, the plaintiff shall serve the amended writs on the person so ordered to be made a defendant. And thereafter, the defendant so served shall file an appearance. When we serve the amended writs on the new person ordered to be made a defendant, the defendant so served shall file an appearance. The next question. On the 15th of October 2022, a circuit court in Kumasi rejected Nana Menzen's application for the interim preservation of vehicle number AB5678C, which is the subject of a lawsuit she initiated against Kodo Bafo. Dissatisfied with the court decision, Nana has enlisted your assistance in filing an appeal against the ruling. What steps will you take to ensure that the appeal is filed? Again, on the 15th of October 2022, a circuit court in Kumasi rejected Nana Mensah's application for the interim preservation of vehicle number AB5678C, which is the subject of a lawsuit she initiated against Kodo Bafo. Dissatisfied with the court decision, Nana has enlisted your assistance in filing an appeal against the ruling. What steps will you take to ensure that the appeal is filed? The answer is as follows. Since the ruling on the interim preservation is an interlocutory order, Section 11 
of the Court Act 1993 as 459 requires that another minister must first leave of the circuit court. It requires that another minister must first, first seek leave of the circuit court before he can appeal against the interlocutory ruling. In the event that the circuit court refuses to grant the leave, in the event that the circuit court refuses to grant the leave, then another minister can repeat the application at the court of appeal. And if it is granted, he can then file the appeal. Again, since the ruling on the interim preservation is an interlocutory order, Section 11 of the Court Act requires that another minister must first seek leave of the circuit court before he can appeal against the interlocutory ruling. In the event that the circuit court refuses to grant the leave, then another minister can repeat the application at the Court of Appeal, and if it is granted, he can then file the appeal. The next question reads as follows. On the 8th of September 2023, the circuit court rejected an application for an interlocutory injunction filed by lawyer, lawyer Amar Mensah. Dissatisfied with the court's ruling, lawyer Amar Mensah personally filed a notice of appeal on the same day at the registry of the Court of Appeal. On the 15th of October 2023, lawyer Amar Mensah seeks your professional advice regarding her appeal. What guidance would you provide to Laura Mensa? The answer is as follows. Since the ruling on the interlocutory injunction is an interlocutory order, Section 11 of the Court Act requires that Amma Mensa must first seek leave of the circuit court before she can appeal against the interlocutory ruling. In the event that the circuit court refuses to grant the leave, then Amma Mensa can repeat the application at the Court of Appeal. And if it is granted, she can then file the appeal. From the facts, since Amma Mensa did not seek leave before filing the appeal, the appeal filed is incompetent and may be struck out. The appeal filed is incompetent and may be struck out. Again, since the ruling on the interlocutory injunction is an interlocutory order, Section 11 requires that Amma Mensah must first seek leave of the circuit court before she can appeal against the interlocutory ruling. In the event that the circuit court refuses to grant the leave, then Amma Mensah can repeat the application at the Court of Appeal. And if it is granted, she can then file the appeal. From the fact, since Amma Mensah did not seek leave before filing the appeal, the appeal filed is incompetent and may be struck out. This is the end of the fourth set of revision questions in civil procedure. Thank you.